Let the darkness take control. Number one. I am from Finland. And that's also where these things that I'm about to describe to you happened. This was some years ago, pre-smartphone slash GPS. It was the end of summer, and myself and two friends were on a camping trip, away up in the north, in Lapland. The mosquito season was over, and the weather was cooling down in anticipation of the coming fall. The three of us had packed food, water and gear for a 10 day trek. The car we arrived in had been left at the parking lot of a visitor center. This happened all within the premises of the Uho Kekonen National Park, a 985 square mile stretch of wilderness near the Russian border. The terrain there varies greatly from treeless and semi-mountainous to dense forests of spruce and pine and dwarf birch. There are lots of swamps. Seeing reindeer is not uncommon and some nights you might hear wolves in the distance. You can run into bear or wolverines in this place, but of course, normally they avoid people. We mostly camped in a tent, but some nights we used shelters and simple huts provided for travelers free of charge. We were five days into the trip and we were the furthest from any kind of civilization that we were going to be on that particular outing. Truly the middle of nowhere. There really is nothing there. No villages, towns or industry. The place is a national park after all. Seeing other hikers happen from time to time. You'd see some people in the distance maybe. Very rarely would you come face to face with anyone. So in the middle of our trip, we were camped in a small clearing. Woodland extending around us for a considerable distance in all directions. It was already dark. We had eaten our evening meal and all three of us were jammed in our only tent. It was a bit cramped, but we fit. We took turns carrying it during the hikes. We were just exchanging some jokes and crude humor in the dark, like guys in their twenties often do, about to go to sleep in our sleeping bags. When we quieted down, we began to hear it, talking and the sound of machinery. Given our location, this was profoundly weird. We camped in a tent because there were no huts nearby. Maybe there was another camp somewhere near us? We couldn't quite make out what was being said, but it was human voices. No doubt about it. But nothing really could explain the sound of heavy machinery. It sounded like an excavator or a tank. Something big and powerful and not too far off. Combined with the sound of talking, we were convinced it must have been some construction yard. But at that time of night, in an unpopulated protected nature reserve. So we got out of our tents. It was cold and pitch black. The campfire had some coal still glowing. So we took out our flashlights. My two buddies had always been a lot braver than I, and the sound was clearly coming from the north, maybe half a kilometer away. We thought the construction might be going on behind a small hill some distance away. We could see no lights or anything. And we still couldn't make out what was being said. The speaking like voice was monotonous, and it was impossible to even say which language was being used. It still sounded a lot like a person speaking though. You may be aware of the sort of spooky phenomenon of just hearing a human voice in static. Maybe you used a blow dryer and been sure someone is talking. Turn it off 
and then it was just something the brain tried to interpret from the steady hum. Maybe it was something like that. It's hard to explain. The machinery-like sound continued. Not loud, but you could sort of make out the powerful engine, at times accelerating adding power, and at times idle. My two friends resolved to go and find out what it was. We put our warm clothes back on, donned our boots, and I sat next to the dying fire, adding some more wood to it, and would stay at camp whilst my buddies left to check out this mysterious construction yard in the middle of nowhere in the Lapland woods. So there I sat. The guys took out their maps, took a compass, heading, and left and I could hear them make their way through the forest. I see the lights from their flashlights, and then they were gone, and the weird sounds continued, unaltered. They were gone for 15 to maybe 30 minutes, and then the better part of an hour. It was odd. Judging by the volume of the sound, they should have reached it. Checking it out had been back already. I added more firewood, and tried to make out what the person was talking about or saying, but it was simply too tiny and obscure. Time ticked away, and they had been gone for over two hours now. I figured they must have stayed for coffee with the construction guys or something. And then the sound just stopped. Just like that. It ended, all at the same time. The engine sound and the voices both just were gone. It was very quiet. I waited for another 30 minutes, very worried now, that something had happened, that maybe my friends were lost. Should I go and try and find them? I shouted their names several times, and built the fire pretty big. I'm not going to lie, I was scared shitless when I suddenly saw the flashlights of my friends. Apparently, they were returning in a hurry. The guys got back to camp out of breath, and they told me the following. They had followed the sound beyond the small ridge in the distance. There was nothing there, and it seemed like they were not getting any closer to the source of the sounds. They had to stop now and then, be quiet and listen, but were able to walk towards it. They walked and stopped like this for some time, but then realised that they were not getting any closer. Their sounds did not change in volume at all. They decided to just go a bit further several times, when suddenly the sound just stopped, like someone had just pressed the off button on a recording. They realised they had been gone for a long time. They were in the middle of dark woods alone. They reversed the heading, and started back at a brisk pace. Eventually they saw my big ass fire from atop of the hill, and found their way back. The weird thing is, we seem to think the sound stopped at different times. They had been gone for two and a half hours total, and they said the sound stopped at around one hour fifteen minutes. Then they started to head back immediately. The return trip taking a bit longer, even though they kept good pace, and they apparently wandered around for a bit. For me, the sound stopped at the two hour mark, just 30 minutes before they returned. We didn't sleep that night, nothing more happened on the trip, and we never found out what the weird construction yard sounds were. When we returned to the park visitor centre some five days later, we asked, but no one knew of any ongoing construction taking place in the whole park area. It's been bugging me ever since. Number 2. This happened three times with three different people. I grew up in a two-story house in the Philippines. Upstairs, there was a huge playroom and four bedrooms. When I was around 11 years old, me and my babysitter were hanging out in the playroom. She went to the bathroom, and I got bored, so I went downstairs to check out the fridge. I heard her come out the bathroom, and she started screaming my name. After the third time, 
She stopped. I thought she figured out that I was downstairs, and after a few minutes, I saw her coming down the stairs. She looked at me, and froze, and was just staring. I asked her what was wrong, and she said she just saw me in the playroom before she went downstairs. She was extremely freaked out, and I don't know. I used to not believe in these kind of things, so I just laughed at her. The second time it happened, I was about 16. I was hanging out at my brother's room, because it's the room with the fastest internet. And then, I heard my six-year-old brother calling me and looking around for me. I didn't answer back, and just waited for him to find me. I saw him go into my room, and then he got quiet. I thought he was looking for something and just found it, and he was walking out of my room. Then he saw me in my brother's room, and he just froze and stared like the babysitter had before. I asked him what's wrong, and he said, Why are there two of you? And that's when I freaked out and ran to my mum's room. She laughed at us, but I remember sleeping in her room that night. The last time it happened I was 20. My parents went on vacation with my youngest brother, so me and my other sibling had to stay at my grandparents that night. The first night they were away, me and my sister decided to go home to get more clothes. We were both in my room, because she likes to borrow some of my clothes, and I told her that I was going to take a shower. That's when she left, and went to her room to pack more clothes. I went to the bathroom, and started brushing my teeth. As I was just about to get into the shower, my sister walked into the bathroom, and she looked at me very strangely. Her face was pale, and I asked her what was wrong, and she said she went back to my room, and was speaking with me. But then she had to pee, so she went into the bathroom and found me there. We both looked at each other, grabbed our stuff and left. I still don't know why or what it is, but I remain creeped out when I think about it. Number three. Last summer, my car was in the shop for quite a while. So I had to depend on rides for friends and family to get around. One morning, my housemate woke me up, saying there was some guy at the door looking for me. I tossed on some clothes and went to see who it was. The man? I'd never met him before in my life. He made me really nervous too, because even though he seemed friendly, the fact that he knew my name and where I lived, well, I thought maybe it was a stalker customer from work, or something worse. Turns out, he insisted I take $40 from him. According to him, I had loaned him the money that night before at a nearby gas station, and as promised, he was paying me back. Only... I had not been to a gas station. In fact, at the time he said we'd met, I'd actually been at work. He looked at me like I was nuts when he said all of this, and eventually just told me, okay, well, I don't know, but you gave me your address to mail you a check. But since you live close, I just decided to pay you in cash. In the end, I took the money. Why not? Free forty dollars. But I was sort of freaked out. Maybe this guy was a stalker, and this was just an elaborate ruse to meet me. Maybe. Then, this happened. Three days later, I had my car again, after forever. I stopped at a nearby gas station, but paid inside because I wanted some bottled water too. There was a guy in front of me in the line, arguing with the cashier. Apparently, he wanted to put $30 in gas in his truck and buy a pack of cigarettes. 
but his credit card kept being declined. This stranger, who looked nothing like the other stranger from a few days ago, was begging for a break. He'd leave his phone, his wallet, anything as collateral. He just needed the gas to go home really quickly and get some cash, and then he would be right back to pay. But the cashier refused. Finally, I just said, that's like $40, right? For the gas and the cigarettes. Yep. I ended up giving him the same two $20 bills the first stranger had given me a few days earlier. He kept saying, bless you, bless you, what's your name? I'll pay you back, where do you live? I swear I'll pay you back right away. I was so freaked out by their coincidence slash strangeness of it all that I decided to break the circle. I gave him a fake name and told him he could pay me back the next day at a store I didn't work at. Was that bitchy of me? I don't know. All I know is that I felt like I had to break the loop, or else I might forevermore be meeting strangers who either needed or have $40 to give me. I never saw either of those gentlemen again. Number 4 Growing up, I would always have these odd experiences. Things would disappear and reappear a few days later in the strangest places. Music would play at odd times, and sometimes I would be the only one who could hear it. I would just know things, and I would have no way of knowing. Mostly, these things were daily occurrences, so I didn't think much of it. But one story will never leave me. It was my 12th birthday, and since my parents were in the middle of a bad divorce, my dad decided to take me to my favourite amusement park near my hometown. Just me and him, as a father-daughter day out. It was a big treat for me, and I was so excited. But then, the day came. I was wearing a new outfit, as was my dad. And I was excited, but still, I almost felt guilty for it. I couldn't figure out what it was. It wasn't a guilt feeling for going to the park. It was more of what was to come. I knew I shouldn't go. Normally, I would listen to this feeling and avoid what I was about to do. But I had been so excited for this day and we had had some rough times, so we deserved to have some fun for once. So we did. In the car, I was telling my dad how excited I was to go, and I could tell that so was he. We were talking, and all of a sudden I turned to him, as we got closer, and said, what if we didn't go to the amusement park? My dad, without hesitation and a smile says, then we can do something else. It's your birthday, so it's up to you. Reply, I'd like to go to the cinema or something. My dad chuckles little and says, yes, of course. But no, I wanted to go to the amusement park and I felt bad to change the plans when we were basically already there. So we ended up going. The first thing we do when we got in was go to our favourite ride, the bobsleigh track. It's a simple ride, but we both really enjoyed it. We stood in the queue, got in the sleigh, and went down the hill in our separate sleighs. I was finally old enough to ride my own sleigh, so this was a big deal. At the bottom, my dad says to me, do you want to go again? I hesitated, but I thought, yeah, why not? We had all day to go on the other rides. The dread hit me again. We got in the queue, and I remember looking at the guy letting us on the ride one last time. It was all too familiar, and it made me wildly uncomfortable. I could tell my dad could sense something was bothering me. 
Why would I hesitate going on my favourite ride again? It wasn't deja vu. It wasn't a dream. I just knew what was going to happen, without knowing it. I know that sounds strange, but this feeling can't be explained. I was on the top of the hill, screaming with joy, having the time of my life. Then I saw it. The dread. The thing that I had been warned about all day suddenly made sense. My dad was lying on the side in the grass, and he was injured. His white t-shirt was covered in blood, and he couldn't move. I hit the brakes as hard as I could, and I took the sled off the track to not be in the way of other people, and pulled my dad off the sled, enough so that he wouldn't be hit. People kept passing us, staring at us, as if we were just part of this show or something. I kept getting more and more furious as no one asked if we needed help. My dad was very visually injured, so there was little to be confused about. I got back on my sled, and sled down to the bottom to get help, and no one seemed to react or care to what I had to say. I was bawling my eyes out, and I felt like no one could see or hear me. At last, a woman approached me. She had seen my dad and asked if she could help. My dad asked if she could keep an eye on me and got help. I sat on the bench waiting. The people working there reacted like zombies, as if we were a nuisance, as if this was all routine. Help finally came, and they carried my dad down from the hill to the ambulance. I followed them, but stopped, looking back up at the ride, hating myself for letting this happen. Every step I took until I climbed into the ambulance were all too familiar. Not like I had done this before, but as if something told me I had just forgot. To this day, I always listen to this feeling. If it's something I'm about to do or someone that I've just met, I avoid whatever it might be as it's the best thing to do without causing alarm, and it has always proven to be the right choice. Number 5 This happened in the early 2000s, when I was working at a juvenile detention centre in a small town in Oklahoma. As a corrections officer, I was working nights at the time and went to work at 9pm. This one night, when I arrived for work, my supervisor looked confused and asked me what I was doing there. I said, I work tonight. And he said, but you called a few hours ago saying that you were sick. I was a bit confused and said, it must have been someone else and they got the message wrong. After everyone else showed up for work that night, it was a bit more weird but we carried on as usual, and assigned everyone their places for the night. I went to work in the control room, where I usually work. The control room is in the centre of the prison. That has direct control over the cameras, doors, phones and everything. After I relieved the guard on duty, and settled in for the night, I looked at the message that said I called in. It said that I had called at 6.50, and said that I had gotten sick while out clearing up after the storm. There had been a storm the night before, and it was quite bad, but not anything that I had to go clean up, so it was quite weird. The supervisor came into the control room around that time. He was also a friend of mine from outside of work, and I decided to call my wife at home and tell her about it whilst he was still sitting there. I picked up the phone and dialed, and after two rings, a man picked up the phone with a raspy voice, and said, Hello? I did not know what to say for a few seconds. I looked at the phone to make sure I had dialed the right number. I had. A few seconds later, the person said, Hello? Again, in the same raspy voice. I said, hello, who is this? 
This is Taylor. Who is this? The person said. My head started spinning. Because my name is Taylor. I said in an almost scream, Where is Anne? He said, Anne is in bed. Who is this? I dropped the phone and told my supervisor to ring me out. I had to get home. And I took off towards the door. I could hear Dave pick up the phone behind me and say, Hello? Soon followed by, What the hell? I ran to my car and drove home as fast as I could. My mind racing the entire time. I bust through the door and my wife was sitting there watching TV and was shocked at me being home. I asked her who was there and she said no one had been there. And after a rather long talk with my wife, I went to call the prison to tell them what was going on. But the phone was dead. I went back to work. And when I came in, Dave was acting weird and asked me, How the hell are you doing this? He told me that when I left, he picked up the phone and the person on the other end sounded like me. He kind of freaked out and hung up. A minute later, as he could see my car leave the parking lot, I had called back from home and asked what the hell was going on. He said that I was a bit irate and said that I was sick and did not feel like playing these games and was telling him to stop prank calling me and hung up. After convincing him I had no idea what was going on, we went back to work. Later, I find out the phone line in my area had been knocked down the entire night before the storm. This is absolutely the strangest thing that has ever happened to me. Number 6 In 2003, my best friend had gone missing and ended up being murdered. It was a huge news story and tore me up inside. Back when it had occurred, there were some issues going on in his personal life. I was living a couple of hours away. Anyway, my birthday was on June 15th, which was a Sunday. I was hanging out at my friend's house in the morning of Saturday, the 14th, from which I distinctly remember having a bad signal on my cell. I was hanging out at the time and we were in front of my friend's house. I called my other friend, the one who was killed, that morning, asking him what he was doing and that my birthday was the next day. And that night, we had planned to go to a rap concert. He said he wanted to come, but there was some trouble and that he wouldn't be able to attend. He mentioned he was with his roommate and I told him that they could both come down. Without giving too much detail, he mentioned he was in fear of his life, and I told him to come lay low at my house, and on Monday, we would drive back and go to the police. My friend, whose house I was in, chimed in, remembering me having the conversation in full. My friend, on the other end of the phone line, said he would drive down and stay over but he never showed up. I called him on my birthday infuriated that he never showed up and he never answered the phone. I didn't think much of it at the time. I was very drunk, but something didn't seem right. I got a call on Monday morning from his long distance girlfriend saying that she hadn't spoken to him since Tuesday. I told her to calm down and that I had spoken with him. Well, I got a call from his parents as well, begging me to go check his dorm room, which he had a roommate at, which they both stayed at the local university. I drove down with the friend I was getting stoned with on Saturday, and we get into his place. He had two baby pit bulls who looked starved when we walked in. There was dog shit everywhere, and we checked the apartment and it was a mess. I went into his room, and there we found a suitcase on the bed, half packed with folded clothes in the bag, very neatly, and this is how my friend always was with his clothing. 
It was a 2-3 night bag, and something was wrong. Fast forward, he was missing for a month, and then, someone pushing his body was found. I won't go into detail about that bit, but I will say that the FBI ended up telling me that he had been dead for two or three days before I spoke with him. Furthermore, there was no cell phone record of the call, or so I was told. I can't say how accurate the body decomp TOD was, due to the body being in a field, during the summer, in a southern state's high heat. The FBI was positive of what they told me though. To this day, I know I spoke to my friend who died. My other friend, who I am still friends with now, can vouch for this. Apparently they say it isn't so, but this is definitely something that will sit with me for the rest of my life. Number 7 In 2007, a few of us went investigating in Belango State Forest, a 4,000 hectare forest in New South Wales, Australia. The site of seven murders by serial killer Ivan Millet in the 1990s. More undiscovered bodies are also believed to still be there. We were with a woman who was an alleged psychic. She led us to a remote spot where she believed some of the many murders occurred. It is approximately 2.30am. We're in a dense forest kilometres away from the nearest highway, in the middle of absolutely nowhere when we hear a large growl of some kind emerge from deep within the forest. Thing is, this growl is completely inhuman, but it's not an animal either. It's hard to describe. Practically demonic. This is when shit gets really weird. Suddenly, we see a red laser light around us, circling the trees. Mind you, we are the only people there. Well, we thought we were anyway. Suddenly, someone in the group gets the feeling it might be coming from a rifle, that someone else is in the forest with us, watching. The eeriest feeling then sinks into all of us, and after a momentary silence, where we were all kind of suspended in sheer, silent, terrorised thought, we suddenly shit ourselves, grab our stuff, and bail. We run for our cars, throw all of our stuff in, and get the hell out of there. Once on the highway, our two cars are travelling relatively close together, at approximately the same speed. The driver in my car, a huge, well-built man of around 6 foot 6, suddenly slams on the brakes, pulls over, and vomits on the highway, simply out of sheer terror. After getting his shit together, we start back on the road. Our other group of friends is in the second car, and are now ahead of us a bit on the road. The driver of this second car is a really slow driver, so we end up overtaking him. My driver friend, the 6 foot 6 dude, starts speeding, and after a while, we are well and truly in front of them. It's around 3am, and there are no other cars on the road. We haven't passed any other cars apart from our friends, who, from what we knew, were still travelling a fair few kilometres behind us. What happened next really freaked us out. Suddenly, out of nowhere, we see another car in front of us. As we get closer, we see it's our friends in the second car who we had easily passed 15 minutes prior. Thing is, there was only one highway. Nobody had deviated from off the road, and we had passed no other cars along the way. There was no way in hell their car could have passed our car without the four of us seeing it. With about eight witnesses to this story, it was definitely the strangest thing we've ever experienced. Number 8 I was catching a sky train in one particular city about 15 minutes from where I get off. While I wait, 
there was a woman with glazed eyes asking people for money. She came up to me, stopped briefly, and asked, Excuse me, could you spare some money? My brother is in the hospital, and I would like some money to buy him flowers. That's rich, I thought. Drug addicts are getting more and more obvious with their lines. Here's five dollars. I gave it to her, without even looking her in the face, convinced of her intentions. Anyway, my train pulls up, and I get on. I look through the glass at her walking around, asking others for money as the train pulls away. The train arrives at the station 15 minutes later, and I walk down to the bus stop. There is only one bus in the direction I'm going, and just my luck. It's waiting there right as I get off the train. So on the bus I hop, and I wait for the bus driver to finish reading his paper before the doors close, and we embark down the highway. About five or ten minutes down the road, the driver pulls over for a routine stop. The doors open, and to my complete astonishment, the woman from the Skytrain walks onto the bus, a dozen roses in hand. She looks at me right in the eyes as she walks past to take a seat, with a little smile. How the hell did she get there? I took the train before her, I watched her as the train stopped from inside as we pulled away. I went over a river, I caught the first and only bus going on this particular direction. And not only did she beat me there, she also had time to go to the store and buy a dozen roses. To this day, I have no idea how this happened. Number 9 a few years ago, I was having some pretty bad anxiety, so I decided to go for a drive. I got on the highway, put on a playlist, and decided I would drive as far as the music took me, then come home. I drove from Denver, Colorado to Santa Fe, New Mexico. Along the way, just after Raton Pass and the little town there, I wanted to stretch my legs, it was maybe 11 or 12 at night at this point, and I stopped at a rest stop, at the top of a little hill, got out and had a cigarette. I spoke with a guy who was also having a cigarette. He told me about how he makes this trip once a year, and that I should probably not go into the bathrooms, as it felt like you were being watched in there. I thanked him for his advice and we looked at the stairs, and we looked at the edge of the nearby mountain range, and then decided to part ways. He left first, and I followed his car down the little hill, and back onto the highway. Pretty soon, I did not see his taillights anymore, but thought nothing of it. I finally got to Santa Fe, and as my playlist was ending, I decided I would turn around and head back to Denver. As I had enough money for either gas or a hotel room, I slept on the side of the road that night, and got back to Denver at around 3 or 4 next afternoon. I called my significant other, and she wanted to go on an adventure, and said that her friends had a place that we could stay in Albuquerque. I scooped up her and her friend, and we went off. I told them about the night before, and meeting the nice guy at the rest stop. Her friend said something to the effect of, There isn't any rest stops just after Rattan Pass. I called bullshit, and sure enough, she was right. The rest stop I had gone to was nowhere to be seen. Not a single one along the way trucked up on a hill the way that one was. Every time my significant other and I make the drive now, the topic of the vanishing rest stops still comes up. Number 10. I watched my mum pull out of the garage and leave to the grocery store. I watched out of the kitchen window at 7 during a California sunset, with the orange tint overlaying everything outside. I saw the car leave, and closed the blinds and had this extremely odd feeling. 
nothing like it before. I went back to the window, and watched the same moment happen again, in the exact same way. I felt like I just burst all the synapses, and got lost in some messed up brain circuitry. When I walked away from the window the second time, I paused. I was spooked, but I wanted to make sure this was over. I couldn't believe that it all just happened, because I swore I saw her leave the first time. So I checked the window one last time, and I was in a seriously dreadful shock to see the same set of actions happening in the exact same way for a third time. I walked away from the window that last time for good, and went to my room to play video games. The whole time, I felt like I was living in an infinite loop of time, where I would never experience another hour other than 7 o'clock sunset in California. I didn't check the clock or the window until my mother came in 10 minutes later with groceries. The amount of eerie I experienced couldn't be spoken. She couldn't have done all of that and come back with groceries in 10 minutes, and I couldn't explain having witnessed her leave at least three times. Number 11. 10 years ago, I was returning home from a road trip with two friends. I received a phone call from my parents, asking when we would be arriving, and I explained that we were about 25 minutes away. About a minute later, we came around a bend. It was a full moon, and we could see the reflection from a lake below us. And other than that, the road was completely empty. Suddenly, something went completely dark in the car. No lights from the dash or gauges, or headlights on the road. The music also stopped, and restarted at the beginning of the CD that we were listening to. There was now a vehicle pulled up over by the police for about a quarter of a mile in front of us, that had not been there a split second ago before. I assume I had dozed off for a second. It was late, and I thought it was still quite peculiar though. After about a minute, the driver of the car turned the music all the way down and said, Did that just happen to anyone else? The other passenger in the back seat sat forward and abruptly exclaimed, I thought I fell asleep. We then realised that the clock in the car was reading an hour later than it just had a minute before. And no, it didn't go from 11.59 to 12. To keep ourselves from freaking out, we decided that the car had possibly had a momentary electrical failure and reset the clock to an odd time. We turned off the dash lights, headlights and the gauges and restarted the CD player. But when we arrived home 25 minutes later, we were an hour late. I am missing an hour of my life. And to this day, I have no idea how it happened. Number 12. A few years ago, I was dating this guy, Kia. Kia and I had broken up in a very undramatic, ugly way. We both said some mean things that we regretted but had not yet apologised. One night, I was overwhelmed with the need to tell him that I was sorry, and to make amends. I called him, apologised, and we spoke for a few hours, and he invited me to New York City where he was living the following weekend. That Friday night, I called him to let him know that I was on my way. I felt this sick, nauseating feeling when he didn't answer the phone. He was an extremely healthy 24-year-old, with no mental illness or health concerns in the slightest. I knew, though, that he was dead. It was overwhelming, the feeling of his absence. I continued to call Kia over and over from his phone, until my best friend stopped me. I insisted that he was gone, and that if I went to his apartment I'd find his body. The city is around three hours away, and at this point, 
I tried convincing myself that my friend was right. Kia was just blowing me off. Around 2am, the police called me from Kia's phone. They said that they'd found his body in his bedroom apartment, and that the constant ringing of his phone alerted his roommates that something was wrong. The police asked me why I continued to call him, and I told him I just had a bad feeling. They had a lot of questions, and ultimately, it was determined that he accidentally overdosed on prescribed pills and alcohol. I don't generally tell people this story, because it sounds crazy, but I know what I felt, and it was the weirdest sensation I've ever had. Number 13. I was a teenager visiting my cousins in San Antonio, Texas. My parents are divorced, and we were visiting my father's sister. So it was my dad, my younger brother, myself, and four cousins, aunt and uncle. We go down there and stay for a week or so every year, and find things around the state to do. Mexico one year, the Alamo River another, river walk the obvious stuff. We were at this enormous water park. I can't stress how big this place felt, and although I can't remember the exact layout or anything like that, I do remember a few key things. There were a ton of people, and it was really noisy. My brother and I have always remained really close. We moved a lot, and shared many of the same friends, with only two years difference between us. Anyway, we were walking much faster than the rest of the family. We kept hearing them call for us to stop, and we'd turn around and wait for them to catch up. In any case, my dad finally figures out that we're too psyched to mosey around this legendary water park. So he suggested that him, my brother and I split from the rest of the group for a bit, and meet up for lunch, and ride some stuff together after that. So here is where it gets interesting. We're walking along one of the paths, still a ton of people around, still a ton of noise. There are little gift shops and whatever lining the path, tree decorations, and suddenly, I have the urge to pee. So I went by myself and found the restroom, not 15 feet away from where my dad and brother were. Because it's a water park, the restroom is kind of designed for wet people, to be walking in and out of all day, so it's like concrete everywhere. Big huge doorway with no door, but angled around a wall cleverly, so no one can look in. It was also a single building, no walls on either sides, meaning you could walk around it. The first thing that struck me as odd, was that there was nobody else in the bathroom. It was slightly unnerving at that moment, I was surrounded by people, and suddenly I felt alone. I finished my business, and instead of turning to the left to leave through the door I came through, I saw to my right a mirrored version of the same entrance. Same style, no door, and angled walls, just reversed. I thought I'd see more parts of the park from the distance or whatever, and then just walk around and continue with my dad and brother. Only, instead of walking out into the water park filled with people, nobody was around. I was totally alone. I couldn't hear anybody either, and I started getting very confused. I couldn't hear anything. I also just felt in my core that I wasn't in the same place, even though the environment looked pretty much the same. I turned back and looked at the door, then walked to the right side of the building, and I couldn't see anyone from that side, and I got really nervous. I continued my way around it, and looked down what I swore was the same path I walked before, and it was empty. I mean, zero people. I thought I got lost, and went through the wrong door somewhere, so I hurried back around, and through the door I exited from, back through the restroom, which was still empty, and out the other side, and waiting for me was my dad and brother, and the noisy crowd that I had been around all day. I didn't think I was gone for a very long time, or at least they didn't say anything and neither did I. In fact, 
I've never told anyone this story. I've never had a reason to, because it's not a ghost story or particularly chilling. It's just this bizarre thing that I've never been able to make any sense of. Number 14. About a year ago, my best friend and I went to eat dinner at Chipotle. It's in a smallish shopping area with a burger joint and a pieway neighbouring the Chipotle. One of those kind of uppy class type shopping areas. We pulled into the parking lot in front of the establishment at around 5pm on a Friday to find it empty. There were no tables outside, there were no cars in the parking lots, not a person in sight, and even the lights inside the buildings were off. Completely confused, I took the car in a sort of loop around the building, in order to leave. The only thing of interest was a single fire truck parked alongside the building, headlights on, but no emergency lights, and no one in the truck. It struck us as a little odd. Maybe a fire in the building? As we pull back around the back side of the parking lot, and then finish the loop around, we drive past the front facade of the building. Except this time, every parking spot is full. Tables are outside, with patrons at them. Food half eaten. There's people walking around, and the lights inside the buildings are on. But the fire truck is gone. Mind you, it took less than 30 seconds to make a circle around the building. Easily one of the strangest things that I have ever experienced. Eight years ago, I was living in a two-bedroom apartment by myself with two cats. I had a girlfriend, Elsa, who lived 45 minutes away on her college campus. Most weekends, she would drive into town and stay at my place until she had class again on Monday. We did regular things, as we didn't get to see much of each other. We like to spend time alone, watching movies, playing games or the like. Please keep in mind that neither of us were drug or alcohol users, as I have a good job and I can't risk losing it, and she simply never cared for intoxicants. Nor were either of us on medication. So here's the scene. It's Saturday night, 11pm. Elsa and I are sitting on the couch watching a movie. We are dressed sober and alert. We slept in that morning and had had plenty of sleep. We were chatting, laughing, talking, and the TV is illuminating our immediate area. And I kept the light on in the kitchen to provide some ambient light for the living room as well. My cats are asleep in their favourite chair as well, and everybody is safe and comfortable. Suddenly, without any kind of warning or inkling, the jump as I have to call it, happened. You know when you're watching dialogue in the movie, and they're using two cameras to film? When they switch from camera to camera, to capture the one speaking, is it seamless? With no clipping, interruption, fading or transition effects? It was that sudden. We were having a good time together in the living room, when in an instant, I found myself sitting on the foot of the bed clothes removed in the dark. For about one and a half seconds, a million thoughts entered my mind. Had something fallen off the wall and hit my head? Did I have a seizure? Was I dreaming the whole time? Where was Elsa? Then the scary part. I turned to my right, and Elsa is sitting next to me on the foot of the bed, clothes removed, her eyes the size of golf balls, and she's trembling. I realise that I am as well. I tried to speak to her and ask her if something's happened, but I'm so frightened, I only stutter. After looking around the room and realised we were alive, she manages to ask me what happened. I didn't want to answer, in case it was just me, and I didn't want to come off as nuts. I just looked at her. After a pause, she starts asking me again if I had turned the lights off or removed our clothes, or if I knew what was going on. I didn't. 
neither of us had experienced grogginess or confusion before this event. Furthermore, we didn't experience any sensation other than fear and confusion after it. No aches, no pains, no bumps, bruises or cuts. I reached for my phone to call my mum and see if a doctor would be appropriate. I noticed that it's not 11pm anymore. It's now 3am. In that sudden instant, that instantaneous change of scene, four hours had passed. Everything in the house had been turned off, and we had been stripped. We went to the ER, as my mum feared that it was a gas leak. No signs of toxins or injury were found in either of us. Elsa made an appointment for a CAT scan, which also came back as expected. I explored possibilities like a gas leak, poisoned consumer goods like our soda or fast food, neurological malfunctions and more. Elsa would get scared at the memory and beg me to just let it go. I couldn't. I'm no writer, but I'm sure I left some things out that should have been more helpful in understanding the magnitude and surrealism of this event and how it affected Elsa and I. If you have an answer, I've been waiting eight years to hear it. Someone tell me what happened to me. Bonus story. I was a total idealist back in high school. So, when choosing a college, I chose to go somewhere that none of my friends were attending. So that I could strike out on my own in finding myself sort of way. Well, I ended up making a few really close friends my first semester. I mean, these guys became like family to me in a matter of months. One day, during winter break, one of those guys, my buddy Kimbo, had gone back home to visit friends and family. And on his return trip to our college, he hit a bad patch of ice and got into a car accident and was killed. It hurt like a son of a bitch for a long time, and I still think about him all the time. But anyway, a few weeks after Kimbo's accident, me and the rest of the guys were getting back off from a party off campus, and we were standing outside our dorm room building, smoking a cigarette, and I felt my phone vibrating when I pulled it out. I saw I was getting a call from Kimbo's phone. Dumbfounded, I showed my friends the phone quickly, and then answered. When I picked up, it just went directly to his voicemail, which played the same message it always had. It never happened again, and we never really spoke about it. But for me, it was one of those someone's looking after me moments. I hadn't been doing very well after his death, but seeing his name show up on my cell phone screen one final time made me feel a whole lot better for a time, and it really helped me get out of the slump that I was in. I have no idea how his phone could have possibly called me, and I doubt I ever will, but this was one glitch in the matrix that I'll be forever thankful for. Rest in peace, Kim, but feel free to call again. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope everyone's code is still intact. We wouldn't want anyone glitching out after all. Don't forget that you can celebrate the new year with my merchandise. And if you're feeling extra generous, why not check out my Patreon? If you'd like me to read your story on my channel, feel free to send it to my email or share it to my Reddit, which of course can be found in the description. Please make sure to include as many details and punctuation as possible to maximize the chances of it being read. Finally, don't forget to click on the link on screen now to head on over to my brother's channel for his brand new video about King Egbert. It's going to be really interesting especially for those of you who watch the TV show Vikings. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. 
stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.